Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? It's a bit rainy today. It looks a bit wet. Uh, anyway, had a good weekend. It's the weekend of putting everything away, you know. Where are we now? 27th of uh, September. So, we have to put the slide away. We have to put the doll's house away. What's going on here? Some form of major obstruction. Oh, someone's getting some bricks delivered. This bloody old red post office, ex post office van. It's always parked here, always parked up the pavement. So I'm on my way to work. We've got the usual uh, assortment of stressful patients waiting for me on a Monday morning. Had a woman in, I say youngish woman, sort of late thirties, had a toothache, we uh, took an x-ray of this tooth and it had some sort of paste, some signs of some paste inside the um, pulp chamber. So we knew that the tooth was dead, we knew that some someone had been in there beforehand. So I said to her, you know, you need to have this. If you want to keep this tooth, you need to have it root treated. And uh, so we root treated it for her and we did a, a beautiful job. I mean, four canals, two distal roots. The funny thing was that uh, obviously when, when we took it apart, out come this bit of cotton wool, which she, you know, said she knew nothing about and couldn't remember what had happened to it or when anything had happened to it, blah, blah, blah. Total you know, dumbness. And uh, so, you know, it looks like obviously somebody had started uh, root filling this tooth and hadn't finished it off. And then, but the pain had gone away. So uh, she, I'm presuming she didn't go back and get the root treatment finished. Because uh, I don't, you know, I mean, I have seen dentists sort of start root fillings and put stupid things inside them. Mainly uh, uh, French stuff, leather mix. Uh, you know, as a sort of a semi-permanent filling. But um, not really, nobody ever really puts cotton wool inside a tooth. If they're you know, going to sort of tell the patients that the, the treatment's finished. Because the you know, cotton wool just breaks down. It's just too organic a material to last for, for more than like a few months or a year or so. Anyway, we pulled this cotton wool out and Ruth did lovely root filling for her and now she's like, oh, on the phone, oh, I've had this root filling done and I'm in so much pain, blah, blah, blah. Which is... We try and put in the advice regarding root fillings. We say, you know, you most get, you'll get some post-operative discomfort. You have to take painkillers, etc. So I'll get her in today and perhaps give her some antibiotics and tell her to take some painkillers, etc., etc. But um, you know, I'm going to not. If people start saying to me, "Oh, this what you've done is painful." And we've had a, just a little run, I wouldn't say a big run, but just a little run of people bringing us up and saying, you know, that denture you did is needs a bit of adjustment or that uh, filling you did has been a bit sensitive, hot and cold or that root filling you did has, has made my jaw ache or that injection you did has uh, made my muscles ache, etc. You start, you let this get out of control, and um, 
before you know it, you know, you start getting the reputation as someone who causes more pain than they cure, which is absolutely not the case. I mean, we had people in last week gushing about how we're the best dentists they've ever been to, but they tend to be the people who have been pain, you know, who've got toothache and uh, who are in severe pain and, and you end up taking a tooth out and or people who've had bad extractions in the past, difficult extractions, you know, the sort of the nightmare extractions, and uh, and you end up taking this tooth out, and they're all like, oh, you know, what a brilliant dentist you are, I'm going to recommend you to my brother and that. So you, you do get some of that, but you get, you get more of the other stuff, because you obviously always hear about the other stuff, whereas you don't, the stuff they hear <laughs> that go well, you never hear about people don't ring up and say oh by the way that thing you did me the other day went it went really well you know just thought I'd let you know nobody does that but um, anyway I shall just uh, tell her that she has had she has had the most brilliant root filling and uh, I forget. I mean, considering that that's a re a retreatment, right? In effect, it's. I mean, I don't know. If you open up a tooth, it's always worse being the second person into a tooth because you don't know what on earth the first dentist that's been inside a tooth has done. They might have buggered it right up. They might have uh, created ledges and steps and. Uh, done all sorts of damage to the internal structure of the tooth and so and also it may be that you know that they ran into a problem that stopped them perhaps they're a good dentist perhaps they ran into a problem that stopped them root treating the tooth and you're going to run into exactly the same problem uh, it's always tempting to think that you can do better than anyone else but it may be that uh, you know they they're they're a better dentist than you. You're just you got more braggadocio than a you know more hoodspur. So you say, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I can let me have a look at that and see what I can do. You know, and then you find you can't. Increasingly, as you get more experience with root fillings, you find that you can. But, uh, but you know, I don't know whether it's just an impression I've got, but. Uh, People are, uh, 40 years ago, you know, in the days when everyone really more or less was headed towards full dentures, they tended to be more, uh, they tended to, you know, they had pain from a tooth. A couple of days after they'd had a filling, it was a bit sensitive to cold. They wouldn't ring up the dentist and say, you know, that filling you did is, is playing up. With root fillings in particular, because uh, and, and also we don't charge a lot. I mean, for root treatments, we don't charge a retreatment fee. We're more likely to charge a you are a pain in the ass fee than we are a, a fee for uh, having to redo something because it may be technically difficult. But we're still charging 500 quid, I think, 600 quid. It's either five or six. I think it's five. I think it's 499 for a root filling and uh, and that's for a re-root treatment and that that is as I say in this case not for a particularly brilliant re-root treatment um, so I just say to the few people who complained about the pain I say look if you've had a brilliant root filling okay, so I would be willing to put that root filling up against any top 10 in the top 10 roof fillings the Oscars the roof filling Oscars all you've got to do is take painkillers and antibiotics possibly until you stop whinging you know until you shut up and then then I'll have saved the tooth but you won't remember that you'll just remember that you know it gave you a bit of post-operative discomfort
So anyway, that's and that's just one, you know, that's just one of the patients I've got coming in this morning. The rest of them are not along the same lines. I'm not don't don't get me wrong, the the rest of them are not all complaints. But the rest of them will be people who are you know, have, have left problems for uh, People who like who had toothache for two weeks and then and then finally decided to ring me up at half past two on a Sunday afternoon to tell me that they've got toothache. We've got this massive fuel, fuel shortage on at the moment. Because we've uh, left the European Union, a lot of the uh, EU drivers are finding it more difficult. They, they don't have freedom of movement now in terms of uh, employment, and so they're finding it difficult to get visas to come and work over here. And um, so we're having temporary shortages, and one of the temporary shortages we're having is in HGV drivers. In fact, if I've got the video up, you can see that someone's got an L plate on there because they're doing, uh, they're presumably they're training. And uh, oh, the Metropolitan Elite or the Chatterati, they're not so much Elite, they're going bananas about it all. And we've had one of these. Um, periods where we've had to fill up with petrol, or well, rather there's been a big run on petrol, in the same way as, uh, you know, they have been in the past, it's not the first time there's been a run on fuel, but the, the difference is this time, there's, I, I mean, when, when the um, lorry drivers blockaded the refineries, there was a shortage of fuel, now there's no shortage of fuel, there's just a... a what happened was somebody leaked a report that uh, said that, uh, that there may there may be a fuel shortage, and um, the the game theory of this is that it's a thing called the riddle of the common, and uh, the riddle of the common basically, so if you can summarise it up as if if everyone else is getting fuel, then why shouldn't I? And then, but if nobody else is getting fuel, then it doesn't matter if I do. So, either way, you do. <laughs> you do if everybody else is, and you do if nobody else is. Because the downside, the consequences of uh, having no fuel are much greater than the downside consequences of having... Uh, too much fuel and just carrying around a load of spare fuel so and the government you know they say that they're guided by the science but they're not really there they don't they don't most of them don't know any science and they certainly don't any don't know any sort of uh, human psychology or game theory that might help them run the country So anyway, uh, I'm a great believer in uh, having stuff in reserve, you know, in the same way as that. Most blokes have got a few bits of old wood in the shed. I've got a couple of, uh, this is a diesel car, and uh, I've got a diesel tractor. And uh, so I have jerry cans of diesel lying around. And so, you know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm okay for the next sort of month or so on for diesel, if I was careful with it. At least until this lot all get themselves sorted out. What is that combine harvester doing? Pulling out around the car. He 
this yellow box here. You don't normally see a yellow, no weighted junction box around the house. Then that's because this is the road where the lawyers used to queue to wait on the Manston airfield on the right hand side here to go to um, Dover. And so the residents of these houses insisted on having yellow boxes painted everywhere so that they could get out into the line of lorries that was expected to be queuing back. In practice they were, they were pretty um, efficient and employed a load of people, not very tattooed people, um, and uh, is now completely shut. So, prices are shooting up. Because the government's printed a ton of money, old Rishi Sunak got drunk on the elixir of being appointed one of the youngest chancellors, or if not the youngest chancellor, and then being told that because of COVID, no one was going to say a word about whatever he might spend. So he went on the embarked on the most massive giveaway, giving away. Uh, at the moment, he's given away £20 extra to everyone who's on Social Security. And now he's found that taking that back is difficult. On the principle that if you give £10 notes away for a fiver, and then you stop doing it, people are going to really, really kick up a fuss. So he's just finding that the, um, the uh, Dishy Rishi is now turning to Fishy Rishi. Because he's trying to get all these money back off of people and we all know money's much more easily spent than it is uh, recouped so most of it's up the wall what you know all this you know help out restaurants and help out uh, car dealers and help out first time buyers builders all the big lobby groups help out hedge funds with uh, carried interest, taxation, and we've got a situation now where the um, the government can't get in enough tax to pay for its, its operations, you know, its day-to-day -day operation. It's literally, it cannot tax because of a thing called the Laffer Curve. Uh, Laffer Curve states that if tax rates are too low, you get less tax. But if the tax rates are too high, you get less tax. Because everybody moves their money offshore, or they find ways of, or they just don't even bother to earn it, you know? So, and Laffer, Laffer um, uh, would be first to point out that, although it's called the Laffer Curve, it's been known for centuries that taxation is, there's an optimal, optimal rate of taxation. And uh, I believe it was the fourth caliph who first came up with the idea. Um, uh, Ali Baka, if I remember correctly. And uh, and he said, you know, you've got to look after your population, make sure that they're prosperous. Because if they're not prosperous, then you're not prosperous. And if you tax them to death, then you have no tax. And Rishi's finding this out. And the government's finding this out. They've optimised as every government does, optimise for maximum take, tax take, unless they come up with some other stupid tax like, uh, I don't know, windfall taxes on, uh, no, it was like, North Sea Oil was a windfall tax, and we're, you know, we're opportunistic, opportunistic theft is basically what a windfall tax is, or um, new taxes like uh, they decide that, uh, uh, because everyone's had such a miserable life and spends their time sitting in their cars and, and behind desks now instead of getting out and about and enjoying themselves walking in the countryside and that and now we all weigh 50 kilos more than we did 100 years ago um, and we're all getting diabetes and diabetes is costing the health service a ton of money so what they want to do is uh, 
try and uh, tax sugar. Um, not because they think taxing sugar is going to cure diabetes, but because again, it's just an, another opportunity for a tax. You know, it's just like another excuse for a, another way to bring in a small amount of money because they're desperate. And uh, so. So what do you do as a government when you're already optimised for tax? It's no use saying it, and you, you hear a lot of young people saying this. Uh, the rich, you know, all you need to tax the rich a bit more. The rich can pay. The rich are rich, <laughs> by definition. The rich have got the money to sort all this out. But in fact, you know, Laffer Curve says no. Laffer Curve says, first of all, the, the rich pay about as much as the rich are going to ever pay they, they, they won't pay anymore they can't pay anymore uh, you can put a tax up to 99% on everybody earning over £50,000 a year and you won't you'll get less tax as a result Pe people don't understand that so what do you do if, as a as a, <coughs> as a as a government if you're oh, Kestrel if you're a zombie government, in other words, you can't even pay the interest on your debt, um, and you certainly can't, uh, your income doesn't cover your outgoings, um, and there are lots of zombie companies like that, and we've got a zombie government like that, um, what do you do? The answer is not increase taxes, the answer is decrease taxes, try and, uh, because, because, and I'll tell you why, because Taxation under those circumstances does not become a way of raising money. Taxation under those circumstances becomes a way of redistributing money. So you can take money from A and give it to B, whatever. But um, the actual government itself has to be funded by money printing. And money printing is a tax on everyone uh, because it decreases the purchasing power of the existing money that's in... Uh, in people's pockets and savings accounts and things like that. But it's a stealth tax. Most people don't even know about inflation as a tax. And uh, when they talk about inflation, they tend to talk about consumer price inflation. They don't talk about money supply inflation, which is the way the government does it, and they inflate the money supply. So you have more money chasing the same amount of goods and stuff, so the price of goods and stuff goes up. And that's, that's what's called consumer price inflation. Then when uh, consumer price inflation goes up, the government says, oh, this is because, um, uh, you know, these greedy uh, dentists or whatever are charging more. And they're putting uh, price, uh, their prices up. And, um, you know, what can we do? And they won't admit that they caused it, you know. That people are putting prices up because they've uh, printed a ton of money and helped themselves to it. So the narrative is that the country's going to outgrow the debt. But that's ridiculous because no country in the world has ever outgrown debt at the rate that our debt is building up and, and at the rate that our country is capable of growing. So, but that's the official line because it's very reassuring and, uh, you know, people like to be told that, you know, don't worry, you can spend money now because uh, you'll be so wealthy in the future, uh, you'll have no trouble making the interest and, and, and uh, principal repayments on it, but um, that's actually never going to happen. The way it is going to happen is that the government is just going to keep printing money if effectively to run the government and to pay the interest on the, the money that's already printed um, and um, and eventually uh, what will happen is it will cost £9,000 to um, buy a ham sandwich at which point the government that will be negligible and uh, unfortunately all your savings will also be negligible your wealth will be negligible, but your house will be worth 10 million pounds. So you'll be happy. 
because you'll be able to go down the pub and pay 200 pounds a pint and say, you know, well, my house, I bought it for 450,000 pounds. It's now worth 4.5 million. How lucky am I? Anyway, it's been going on for hundreds of years. And they'll probably carry on for a bit longer. Although forces are afoot to change things. But those of you who listen to my podcast regularly will know what I'm talking about. Anyway, here we go. Wish me luck. I'm not going to put up with any nonsense from these patients. Oh no. I'll talk to you later. Bye.